hope people are still coming back. Welcome to session six. It's uh, sadly already the final session of this Cherry Blossom Financial Education Institute. So um, time flew by so fast, I have to say. <laughs> I'm a little shocked it's already the final session, but I know or I'm sure that I will think a lot about all the results and findings and presentations and um, information that I got um, and learned and listened to over the past two days. And on top of that, of course, also the next three presentations that will be presented this afternoon. And we start with the production of financial literacy presented by Giovanni Gallipoli from the University of British Columbia. Then right after, we welcome back Luis Obera, who will present measuring financial literacy with the big three. And lastly, but not least in our session today will be Luisa Blanco from the Pepperdine School of Public Policy, who will talk or present us the impact of a mobile phone delivered digital fin financial education program on financial behavior among Hispanics. So I'm very excited and the floor is yours. Click it right here and if you use this, it's on. Okay, so thank you for, for having me and uh, uh, yeah, thank you for sticking around until the end. <laughs> and uh, I've been quietly soaking up all the knowledge, especially in fields that I don't usually work in. So this is the first time I'm here and I've enjoyed it thoroughly. I learned a bunch of stuff. This is work actually with Sebastian who was here just uh, before, uh, the presenter of the previous paper. And uh, as I said, the, the paper is, is joined with Sebastian who actually is all PhDs on financial literacy. And so for me, this is a new area. And to a large extent, uh, I'm working on this thanks to him because you know he, he made me interested by actually kind of doing all the legwork and <laughs> teaching me stuff I didn't know before. So um, in particular, in this project, what we try to do, we, we try to um, isolate from a select set of noisy proxies that you'd see are proxies that have been used in many papers in the, in the workshop in the last few days, uh, some signals. So you should think of these as um, isolating the latent, unobserved um, degree of financial literacy as well as other latent factors that might interact with financial literacy over the life cycle of agents in a model of skill formation. So uh, why are we interested in this? Because we think of financial literacy in this paper as a evolving um, object that evolves together with wealth over the life cycle of agents. And in fact, you'll see that we are looking at agents that are adults. So some of the questions over the last couple of days were, shall we focus our efforts on uh, young people? And presumably the correct answer is yes. Another kind of set of question is like, can we actually help people later on? Are there decreasing returns? There's something to do with age. Does the financial literacy depend on the level from which you start and so on? So the kind of questions we have in mind are uh, therefore related to how these competencies evolve over the life cycle, uh, whether they relate. The, and I'm talking not about the, just the measurement per se, but the underlying latent factors, whether they relate with income, age, education, other observables. And uh, in particular, one latent factor that will show is quite important in the development of financial literacy is actually risk aversion. Or I like to, in this paper, I like to call it risk tolerance because the more tolerant to risk you are, the faster you accumulate by learning by doing uh, uh, financial literacy. And, and, and you'll see how it works in minute detail. So let me start from a little bit of history of uh, economic thought rather than the, my, my own paper. So what, what we're going to use is a very well established by now um, approach that was developed by Jim Ekman and a bunch of co-authors. In particular, this is a, a very famous econometrica paper for where they won the Frisch Medal and then has been adopted in a variety of other work, uh, in particular in recent work on development uh, in India by Atanasio Megir and Nix. This is, these are papers where uh, you should think of this uh, approach as a kind of fancier factor model, a, a factor model that is dynamic in nature, okay? 
And the reason why it's interesting, and, and there is a little bit of history of economic thought behind this, is that the reason why Jim Ekman worked on this stuff is that uh, um, there are two views of inequality. Sometimes I call them the macro view and the labor view. In the macro view, you have everybody as the name of the game is everybody's ex ante identical, and then you can kind of accumulate shocks over your life cycle, say the Agatha Yagari framework, and the, the, there is divergence, or perhaps in search models, that's also macro, like everybody's identical, but there are frictions. So, uh, uh, you know, frictions make people diverge. So this is like really about the mechanism of heterogeneity. In labor, the view is more like there is some kind of slow moving or permanent type. And it's something that we have to, rather than study per se, we should control for it. So hence the difference in difference and all the kind of other methods that have to do with teasing out that uh, component, right? Now, Jim Ekman, of course, is more on the labor side of the literature, but he also kind of appreciates the nice nuances of understanding the mechanism of what, what the heterogeneity is. The heterogeneity is not some kind of sideshow that we should just ignore. The heterogeneity is interesting per se, so what he did in this work, he said, well, let me, let me try to figure out how this heterogeneity is generated at early ages. And there ends all the literature on parental investments, accumulation of human capital, uh, skill formation. But this literature is focused on early life. And, you know, the kind of models that are studied in this literature use data like the NLSY that gives us information about the accumulation of skill formation at early ages. What we are going to do, we are going to move this focus to later life here, okay? So this is just to kind of put things a little bit in context. Now, you see that effectively what we are going to estimate is a production function, a dynamic production function. In fact, it's gonna be a CES, a constant elasticity of substitution production function, where TFP depends on household characteristics and uh, the nice thing that you can do with this approach is that since there is no obvious metric for skills, I don't know what my skills are or somebody else's skills are. I can rank them in an ordinal sense, but there's no cardinality. What, this approach allows you to anchor skills to actual um, tangible outcomes, like for example, returns, like portfolio returns. And that's what we are going to do. So we can kind of give a value that is actually closer to a cardinal statement in terms of how many percentage points more of returns you get by developing these skills dynamically, okay? Now, in order to do this, you need longitudinal data, first of all. So you need to observe people over time with measures of some kind of financial competencies. And we are going to use measures that, you know, all the big three, five, whatever you want to call them. I, but they, they are the kind of measures that are used normally in the literature. And we are going to focus on, a, on German data. So this is actually quite useful data and credit to, to, to Sebastian for finding it. But uh, this is actually from the Bundesbank, which is the central bank of Germany. Uh, they report uh, financial data for households, uh, quite detailed with their portfolio and information about uh, um, uh, changes in their net worth over time. And they also report questions about their financial literacy, which we consider like, we're gonna consider them like, uh, again, in the spirit of Jim Ekman, we consider them like noisy, uh, noisy measures of which, from which you can tease out some underlying um, stock of capital, okay? Which is going to be the stock of capital that we call financial literacy. And uh, in this data, there is, uh, the data is organized so that there is always something, someone called a financially knowledgeable person. Uh, who answer questions related to assets, wealth, risk, attitudes, financial competence. In fact, this is quite interesting because within households, to the extent that there is specializations, you would expect that being married increases the household level of financial literacy because you get, you get the, bet, the better of two draws, right? And this is part of the, 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 the part of the paper, one part of the paper of which I will not talk almost at all today, but I find it's kind of interesting. And... Um, I'm not going to spend much time on the questions. You know, the questions on inflation, diversification, compound interest rate, discretionary savings. These are the kind of questions that they ask. One thing that you can do with these kind of models, you can actually understand by, um, by using these methods, the relative signal to noise ratio of each of these. And I'll try to show you a table, if I have time, that tells you, at least for the purpose of this exercise, you shouldn't take this as a general statement, which of these different noisy measures 
carry the highest signal for the kind of variable we are interested in. So it's a little bit of a funny accounting, but uh, it's a useful accounting value. Okay, so let me tell you, first of all, what's the model. This is the model without anchoring. So this is the model where I only use the ordinal nature of the latent factors. I, I don't tell you anything about the dollar worth of financial literacy. This is just saying, okay, suppose that there is a factor that I call financial literacy. It's unobserved. I call it theta one. Another factor that I'm gonna call household resources. Think of this as really Friedman style permanent income, like something that is a function of wealth, income, and so on at the household level. And then there are risk attitudes, okay? This I'm gonna refer to it as risk tolerance eventually. And think of a production function. Forget about this part here. This is from here on to the left, it's a CS, right? There is a raw parameter that dictates the substitutability. When rho goes to zero, you get the Cobb Douglas. And there are three production, fun uh, production inputs. Theta one, financial literacy, which is a function of, so in T plus one, it's a function of itself in period T. Theta two, household resources, this permanent income measure, if you want. And theta three, risk attitudes, okay? And they get substitute. So if rho was one, they would be perfect substitutes, of course. As rho goes to zero, they become, uh, there is complementarity, more and more complementarity. And then you multiply this by something that is a TFP factor, okay? A TFP factor that is a function of a bunch of observables. You can see the list here. Uh, some shock. And then there is this funny guy here with a hat. This is, you'll see that this is something that we use to control for endogeneity. This is what you call a control function approach to account for, because the endogeneity in this kind of production technology, like uh, in IO, in macro, when you estimate this kind of stuff, you often have situations like, the example here would be, if you are more financially literate, this thing is not constant, right? It will respond, it's endogenous effectively. So you have to be a bit careful, but you know, it, there's nothing particularly fancy about estimation, estimating these production technologies. Now, I'm going to do the one with anchoring. With anchoring, you have the same production technology with three latent factors and uh, an extra equation. And the extra equation is what we call the anchoring variable. And this is exactly Athanasio and Megir. This is no more or than, than what they do, no less than what they do. It's pretty much the same approach. You take something that is measurable. In their case, it could be outcomes like body weight or... Um, uh, ability to write or whatever. And in our context, this is returns, okay? So what you do is you, you for each household I in period T, you define something that is the ratio of uh, household wealth over successive periods minus one. And uh, this includes a bunch of things, capital gains and so on. And uh, you define then the notion of excess return. Think of this as some kind of residual relative to what's predicted by your characteristics that might have something to do with financial literacy. So if you are the kind of household that everything else constant, there's a little bit more financial literacy, perhaps you're able to generate a little bit higher excess returns, okay? And I can add this equation here. And now I'm gonna say that this excess return is some kind of linear function of the unobserved latent financial literacy, okay? So there is a linear relationship. This is, you, you want it see as simple as possible because it makes interpretation much easier to, to have. After some algebra, you can actually rewrite the production technology as something that takes the same factors as before, but now this is really, if you do if you do the algebra in your mind, this is a log, right? This is exponentiated. This is really a relationship between excess returns in T plus one and excess returns in the past plus two other latent factors. So pretty much everything is observable except theta one, theta two, and theta three. Now, how do you, how do you go about estimating this stuff? Well, there are a bunch of steps I don't have time to tell you, but effectively you do what's called the measurement system. It's a, it's a factor estimation. It's an unobserved factor. But rather than pushing a button in R or SATA, you have to go through a little bit of uh, kind of steps. The nice thing about doing all the steps is that you can actually generate samples that allow for arbitrary correlations between these variables and two counterfactuals. So that's the big advantage of doing the kind of ECMA style dynamic factor models. This, uh, this is an outcome. This is what I'm plotting here is uh, um, financial literacy. This is, by the way, centered at zero. This is the non-cardinal thing. This is just to show you how it's distributed for um, uh, different education groups, okay? So in this case, the continuous line, the solid line is high school, college, I don't know how you call this, 
and then the dotted one, okay? And you can see that there is a uh, rightward shift in financial literacy. You know, people who are more educated tend on average to be more financially literate. Perhaps not surprising. To me, the most surprising thing is the, the, the wide overlap of these things. Like it seems that, okay, this is general human capital, right? This is, I'm not telling you whether you're an engineer or a, an economist or something else, but you can be an engineer that has less financial literacy than somebody who's a high school dropout. That's, that, to me, when I saw this graph, I said, this is really, this is really cool. This is an orthogonal dimension of variation, which may be even more, when, when, when Sebastian showed it to me, it made me even more interested in this. Because I said, like, this is, uh, this is really funny. It shouldn't be, the, uh, this thing should be spaced, but they're not, they're not that spaced. Now. <laughs> okay, no. I, I haven't tested doctors. I usually, I freak out when I go to the doctor. I don't ask them what they are doing with their money. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, okay, so let me take the measurement system, the, 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 the two equations that I mentioned before. So there is the production technology and the anchoring equation. You can actually estimate parameters like rho. So what, what would be rho? Here we actually estimate it to be effectively zero. This goes to the third decimal. Zero means Cobb-Douglas. I complementarity between these things. So it means that in the dynamic accumulation of financial literacy, these two things will be important, okay? So, and this is very important for policy because if you want to design a policy, you might uh, either kind of give something more financial literacy directly, or you might try to facilitate the other latent variables in the production. This is a dynamic process, it's, it's a production part. Then you have this S1, S2, and, the, and the, residual, right? One minus S1, they, they sum up to one. And this is what we report here, right? These are the weights of financial literacy, S1, 0.17, resources, household resources, S2, and then the remainder is uh, risk tolerance, okay? That I don't report here because it's one minus the other two. And you can see that there is a fair amount of persistence, but it seems that it's kind of funny because really, it's not about how much financial literacy you had in the past, but it seems that it's really permanent income that is a critical input in the production of this stuff. The other thing that I want to show you in uh, very quickly is, um, first of all, you can see the densities also for, um, oh, I cannot do this. Can I do it? Oh. I don't think I can. Well, you can see the densities for different observables, like by gender uh, and by education. It's okay, I mean, I, I can show you the one by education, it's totally fine. So, so think of the education one, the education entered in TFP. So you can show that the difference in financial literacy between two individuals who are parachuted, two identical individuals who are parachuted in different education groups can be written in the model like this. So this gives you the marginal, um, the marginal return to an extra year of education, which we estimate to be negative. So when I first saw this, I said, no, this is wrong. We are, we are doing it wrong. In fact, actually, it's not wrong at all. And it's actually quite interesting because what happens is that once you look at the average, um, at the average change in financial, at the average level of financial literacy for different education groups, say high school, uh, drop, uh, high school, college, and postgraduates at different ages, young, middle age, old, you observe that, first of all, they can be ranked like this, but these are averages. We've seen that graph with the density before. Of course, the averages are uh, different from each other there. But you can see that this grows really fast, right? This is kind of growing less. This is decreasing returns. This is exactly the notion of decreasing returns. When you start from a higher level, you still improve, but you eat decreasing returns, which is the argument why you want to spend your budget on poorer people. people people with less education, people who start from a lower level, because the returns are so much higher, right? So there was nothing wrong in the estimate. The estimate is totally correct. In fact, these models, I, I, I would say, I would strongly advise to use them because they work remarkably well with data. It's, it's, they, they work well, they fit data really well. So you can actually see also one thing. How about young and old? What if I split the sample between young and old? And here, the nice thing about this is that you can generate these samples by the structure of the dynamic production function with the measurement system, you can actually, you don't have sample size problems. You can kind of do all your counterfactuals for large samples if you want. And you can see that the one that really is striking, this gamma one, remember what gamma one was? I don't have a lot of time, but gamma one is the return. This is a semi-elasticity. This is an excess return. 
and this is your financial literacy. This is really the marginal mar money worth of financial literacy. And this estimate here tells me, you should divide this by 10, by the way. This is roughly uh, 0.14, uh, uh, this is roughly 14%, 15%, okay? Uh, I, I could explain why you have to do that, but let, let me go fast. But this is a 15% return over a period of three years. This is saying that if you are young, a one standard deviation change in the log of financial literacy is worth roughly 15% excess returns, which is to me, it's a remarkable amount of, <laughs> but it, it goes to basically zero. It's not significant when you're old, not as much. There is depreciation of financial literacy and the marginal return goes down. So this is really something about the young, even though we estimate an adulthood model, these are not children, these are adults. But younger adults, the investment is still very, very valid. I mean, you get a, get a lot of bang for the buck. Um, what can I tell you in, in more? Like this is, uh, taken, if, you, if you look at these patterns, both the decreasing returns, like uh, the, um, uh, the one that I showed you with the lines before, and uh, this one on the, on the gamma one, these patterns show that the accumulation of financial literacy depends a lot on learning by doing, and the learning process might be vigorous at younger age. Why do I say that it depends on learning by doing? Because you can see that um, there is, uh, I'm gonna show you in this graph. So this is like the, the extra return, Div divide this by 10. So this is an extra 10% return over three years, extra 20% return, 0.1 would be 10%, 0.2 would be 20%, 0.3 would be uh, 30%. And this is the distribution of for young and old. You can see that they're both, thick on the right tail, but uh, for the young, they are thicker on the right tail. There are way higher return. Now I'm gonna just do the same thing just for the young. And I'm going to show you that now I split the young in those who have high risk tolerance, these guys are less risk averse, and one who have low risk tolerance. And it's remarkable, like the difference is like, this is almost twice as much. Risk aversion, which we often kind of say, oh, risk aversion has something to do with being prudent and therefore good. It's a good thing, right? But if you are young and you are more risk tolerant by, by experimenting with new things, even if you fail a little bit, even if you fail a little bit, that's good for you over the long run. And this is actual money. This is an extra 22%, 21, 22% return over three years. So these are, this is not peanuts, this is uh, uh, sizable. And again, you can kind of see that the difference in the average is almost 10 percentage points here. So risk tolerance, is complementary in this production technology to, to, to financial literacy, produces more financial literacy and produces higher excess returns in portfolio in, in this set of German households. So one last thing I want to say and then I'm done, you can actually split the financial literacy distribution, this latent factor into three tertiles, lowest to highest. And you can see that again, the gamma one is the anchoring equation, right? The one that gives you the extra excess return. This tends to be a lot larger, although it's very imprecisely estimated, but it tends to be, because that's the nature of returns. They are, they are extreme, they are all over the place. But it tends to be high when you are in the low financial literacy and uh, low when you are in the high financial literacy. Again, this means that spending the money on the people who have low levels, given the nature of the production technology, with decreasing returns is the margin you want to hit as a policymaker. And uh, well, you, one thing that we are trying to now work on the paper is to kind of simulate paths of wealth and excess returns to see what happens at retirement. How much of the um, cross-sectional variation in assets, say, at different ages, can we account for simply by the dynamic process of financial literacy accumulation and excess returns? kind of compounding over time. And that's something that we are working on right now and uh, we're still doing it, but uh, one, one thing that I would say, and I'm done, is that uh, if you want to think about policy, using this kind of framework is extremely valuable because it kind of allows you to kind of quantify the, 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 the complementarity between different levers, policy levers. And what you learn from this is that the most efficient interventions may in fact depend on household characteristics. So simply saying that I want to kind of go and teach people financial literacy is, is fair enough. I mean, we should do that. But changing also a little bit 
tweaking, the, the willingness of people to experiment, for example, to say, okay, go a little bit outside your comfort zone and try to learn about these other things, because rich people use them. <laughs> it's might my, 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 my be like, you know, you don't want to tell them like you, you want to bet the farm on some kind of derivative thing, but perhaps like take a little part of your budget and kind of put it in, in, a, in a fund which has a little bit more risk or learn that sticking around for 10 years perhaps gives you a very high return. Like that's actually very valuable and dynamically it has very large payoffs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, my question is uh, taking uh, the idea that the returns are better for the younger and those that are less well off. Um, what what should we think about for returns of people that might be not so well off at later stages of their lives when they're they're vulnerable? Is there a way for your model to start thinking about the like so, near so, retirement or things like that? So th that's exactly what what I meant when I said about thinking about policy. I mean, at this point, you can see that if you are poor, that's really generally a, a really bad thing for financial literacy because. Your household resources, your, your permanent income, dynamically explain a lot of that. Then, what, what you really want to do is kind of, I, I wouldn't suggest going through the, through the route of uh, increasing risk tolerance of these guys either, because they are old. But see, that's the targeting you want to do. You want to say, based on age, perhaps the best thing I can do is actually kind of go straight and tell you basic concepts of financial literacy. We also find that there is a fair amount of depreciation, by the way, over time. So you, you actually forget stuff. It's not that uh, uh, it, it stuff, you, you teach it once and it stays with you. You, you are at a new level. No, like in all models with the capital stocks, and this is effectively a capital stock model, things go up, things go down. So what you wanna do with the older people, especially if they are poor, is to perhaps spend more budget on this. With younger people, you can do other things. You can substitute. You can kind of, for example, give them perhaps small amounts of money, if there is a budget, you can give them small amounts of money to, 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 to play with and say like, hey, here is like $150, put it in the mutual fund and see what happens over the next three years. Like, you know, it's not a lot of money, but it's not about what they gain in terms of money, it's what they learn about putting the money there. So, oh yeah, so I have um, kind of a, a so does you I mean the, the, this kind of interaction between uh, the, the financial literacy and the learning by doing is it that like would you say that this says that there may be like those uh, gamification that uh, sometimes uh, I mean of course gamification is a very kind of uh, I, know, I, 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 I get what you mean yeah, I, I've been wondering I don't know yeah. I think I think yes I because, think I mean my dream would be to have maybe you know like a Robin Hood combined with Anna Maria Luzardi that teaches you <laughs> that teaches you kind of financial <laughs> where you have like a fake account maybe right and when you actually learn no but that's exactly I mean you have the, the thing is that we always think about prudence as being a good thing right but if you can actually game it and make it not too expensive of course okay, yeah. then you pay, make people realize what they are missing right and this is extremely complementary to the accumulation of financial literacy later in life so perhaps you're young you don't have a lot of savings but the fact that you actually kind of say, oh, well, I remember that I played that game and that was a good way. Perhaps by the time you are older and you start thinking about <laughs> what to do with your money, a little bit of your money, perhaps you put it there, which is what the more financially literate people, literate people do. And, and in fact, one of the gaps between men and women, I think, might have to do with the fact that uh, by gender, the risk tolerance is different. And uh, so you, you really want to kind of tweak these different... So, this stuff is important when designing the policy. And if you do financial literacy in the poor schools, they could not? In the poor school, well, I mean, that's where the big margin is because when it's low, the production technology has high marginal returns. Like think of a Cobb Douglas. But, uh, but, but you want to do it in poor schools and don't tell, don't tell the kids, don't, don't freak them out and say, hey, put everything in bonds. Like gambling is bad. Gambling is bad. But this is not gambling, you know. <laughs> you want to kind of also elicit a little bit of the response on the experimentation side, so that they can. Because if you don't fall from the bike, you don't learn how to ride a bike. So you don't want them to break their legs falling from the bike. But you know they need to they need to fall a few times before they can run, ride the bike.
Okay. Hello again. Hope you're not getting tired of me today. <laughs> so this is the paper I'm actually here for. So it's about a deeper validation analysis of the big three and big five financial literacy items together with uh, the two inventors of the financial literacy items. And uh, it addresses, I think, a major concern uh, coming from our adjacent disciplines, such as psychology. And that's why we conducted this deeper analysis, this item functioning analysis uh, using modern psychometric procedures that are also being used in educational large-scale assessments, such as PISA and TIMS. To give you a quick background, um, measuring financial literacy via the big three or the big five has become a norm in the literature. We can say as a consequence um, that these items have gained uh, somehow canonical status, which I think reflects their practicability for the use in larger household surveys, surveys that are not geared toward one single objective, right? And um, despite their popularity, uh, their were also there was also criticism coming from other domains um, such as educational science or as I've mentioned um, psychology and maybe there are just two different worldviews here um, we as economists we want things to be short uh, to be practical to be efficient right uh, whereas psychology the psychology psychological domain or the psychometric domain to be clear has a long tradition on how to measure those latent traits such as personality and uh, also like in this case domain specific cognitive capabilities so a psychometrician may ask hey uh, so many researchers are using those items um, do we know anything about their item functioning um, how valid are they um, are they measuring what they ought to measure and that is what we want to address in this paper. So we are conducting a psychometric evaluation of these most used financial literacy items by using data from the 2018 National Financial Capability Study from the RAND ALP. And to give you a quick, back, uh, a quick um, preview of the results, um, these psychometric criteria that we have evaluated um, shows that there is one, no evidence of a so-called item bias, which refers to differential item functioning. This is basically um, meant by test fairness. So the items work the same for different subgroups. I come back to that in a bit. Second, they have high discrimination power between low and high achievers. This is also what we want. And we are measuring indeed a unidimensional construct. So we are measuring one latent trait and not something else. Also, with regard to correlations, uh, we see that the FL measures the big three as well as the big five have predictive power for various, various financial outcomes. And also demographic correlates uh, mirror correlates that we have already seen in the literature. So when it comes to um, previous literature and um, scales that has been used in this realm, we can uh, quote here, Ms. Houston 2010, that already criticized um, and these scales and said uh, they would be deficient to capture such a broad construct. But she already insisted, okay, we have this broader scales with 10 items or 20 items, and we can use this, um, these modern psychometric procedures and reduce them number by number. So what are these scales that are out there? Uh, there are 20 item scales from Noll and Hout um, in Journal of Consumer Affairs. They were using IRT procedures, item response theory. These are these um, psychometric procedures that are being used in PISA. They reduced these 20 item scale to 10 items a few years later, also using IRT. 
And uh, then we have Fernandez AR, the meta study in management science, uh, which consists of 13 items, um, but they are were using the so-called classical test theory. So uh, those were more like the older procedures being used in psychometrics. So we can ask, is there a need for more extensive item set or are we fine using a reduced item set, the big three or the big five? And the question is, as always, it depends. Let's first have a quick look at the data. As I said, we are using um, the National Financial Capability Study from the RENT ALP. It consists of 1,233 um, respondents. It's supposed to be representative, but it's a little bit skewed towards upper socioeconomic statuses. There are weights in included, population weights and survey weights, weights that we are using um, to tackle a little bit the disproportionalities. The financial literacy questions we are investigating, these are um, numeracy, inflation that you are not all aware of, and the risk diversification, the last one, they are uh, making the big three, and all of these items um, making the big five. So how are these psychometric procedures work from the item response theory, or IRT? So this is the basic model, so to speak, or the general IRT model. And um, it looks easier than it, or it is uh, in fact easier than it looks. Um, basically the probability of solving an item correctly is mainly dependent on the difference between the ability of person V minus the difficulty of the item I. And then we can add to that framework different parameters of the item and we can then investigate several important item characteristics such as difficulty, discrimination power, guessing behavior, and so on and so forth. The easiest way to graphically represent this framework is the so-called item characteristic curve, which uh, models the probability of solving the item correctly as a function, as a logistic function of this latent trait here, uh, or a latent trait continuum where the average respondent has the value zero and uh, more proficient individuals are above zero and less proficient individuals are below zero. And as I said, within this framework, we can investigate several important item characteristics, such as difficulty. Difficulty refers to the location of this curve. So items that are more easy tend to be more on the left. Items that are harder tend to be more on the right. So the black one is harder than the gray one. The second important metric is item discrimination. Maybe the most important in my opinion. Discrimination means how well does the item discriminate between low achievers and high achievers. And this refers to the slope of this curve. This is our alpha here in the formula. So how sensitive is a change in the ability or how, um, yeah, how strong is uh, a change in the ability affecting the probability of solving the item correctly. That's one way to put it. And we want rather steep curves than flat curves. So imagine a complete horizontal line here as an item characteristic curve. That would mean no matter how proficient I am, I have the same probability of solving the item correctly. We don't want that, right? So we want steep curves here. That is item discrimination. And then we can model in additional parameters like a guessing parameter for multiple choice items, which uh, refers to a lower asymptote of this curve, um, meaning that low proficient individuals have a certain probability of solving the item correctly by guessing. And we can also model in the opposite for the higher proficient individuals. So um, here they have a reduced probability of solving the item correctly. So the, um, the respondents with um, a high proficiency just by inattention or fatigue. So these are different IRT models in fact. So we can only model the difficulty, then we have a one parameter model or 
additionally the item discriminant, then we have a two-parameter model, and so on. And the first thing we have to investigate is which model fits best to our data. And this is what we are going to do. So basically, we are um, using this predicted curve, and we lay over it an empirical curve, and then we test for statistical differences by a chi-square statistic, and that is what we did in the first place. And we see here the significance of the deviation for each model. And there we find that the model with two parameters, so with difficulty and discrimination, fits best to our data with the least deviation um, between empirical curve and um, predicted theoretical curve. And the two-parameter model is actually the model also being used in PISA and TIMS. So we are working with our two-parameter model, and let's have a look at the item statistics. So I mentioned already that there is this item response theory, these modern psychometric procedures, but there's also the classic test theory. So this is uh, how psychometricians worked before these new procedures came out. And um, here we have two metrics. This is the frequency. Um, this is referred to item easiness, the solving frequency. Um, that's quite easy to inter interpret. And here we have the item total correlation. This is also a discrimination metric. It basically shows us the correlation between the item response and the overall score. Or in other words, how predictive is my item response to the overall score? So we want positive correlations here, right? We don't want zero because zero would mean um, it doesn't matter whether we are proficient or not for our total score. Or a negative value would be even worse when you have negative values. This would mean um, low proficient individuals sold the item and high proficient individuals don't solve the item. So this is also something we don't want. And as we can see, as a first result, they are, um, have sound correlation values. There are threshold suggestions in the psychometric literature um, how high they should be. They range from 0 0.2 or at least 0 0.3. I'm not a big fan of these thresholds because we have also um, a confidence band that we have to uh, incorporate. But basically, when we would follow these guidelines, um, we would say from a classical test theory standpoint, these items discriminate pretty good. Let's go to the IRT analysis. So here we are estimating our slope. When you remember the curve, um, this is our slope parameter. Here are also textbook recommendations available that I'm also not a big fan of. But um, I would say it should be at least above one um, to be a sound discriminator. And what we are seeing here for the big three is that are, they are even above two. So I would say they are very good discriminators. When we run the same for the big five item set, we have still the values above, above two for the big three um, and also at least values above one for the bonds item and the mortgage item. So as a first result, taken together from classical test theory and also this modern um, item response theory, we can say these item set or these items appear to be very good discriminators between low and high achievers. Much more important is the so-called test information function. This is uh, also a very important metric. The test information function shows us at which ability level the test gives us the most information about the respondents. Okay. And we did that one for the big three and the big five. And what's salient here is that the big three gives us the most information in a more low proficient area, okay? The big five, on the other hand, also has its peak below the zero, but goes a little bit further to the right, um, captures a little bit more high proficient individuals, but I would say not much more. Okay, so they have pretty similar test information capabilities. So um, we can say 
as a consequence that the big three are doing a good job when it's about capturing competences, the financial literacy of more lower, low proficient individuals or below average individuals. The last metric within this IRT universe is the so-called differential item functioning. Differential item functioning means we get back to our curves now when different subgroups exhibit different curves. Here, for instance, this is from simulated data, not from the big three, um, when uh, male respondents have a higher probability of solving the item correctly, given they have the same ability. We don't want that either. This would mean that we are capturing some other ability that infers with our financial literacy. So this refers indeed also to construct validity. And what we are basically doing is we scale these um, curves separately for the two subgroups and then test the parameters for statistical differences. And how big are these differences allowed to be? Well, we will never have completely overlapping curves here. This uh, will not happen in reality, but there is a classification scheme out there that is also being used in PISA. It's from the educational testing services in um, Princeton, and they categorize um, certain thresholds by magnitude and also significance, not only by magnitude, um, in A, negligible, B, moderate, and C, severe diff. And we did this diff analysis for the indicators gender, employment, education, and also race. And as we can see, yes, there is some diff going on. This is the difference, and this is uh, referring to the significance. Um, so magnitude and significance. And um, so this is the T-square statistic, actually, um, not the p-value. And they all show us that it's value A. So we have a negligible diff effect here. Okay, we have some diff, yes, but it's negligible. And this is true for all four um, indicators that we have here investigated. So as a consequence, the test items appear to be fair. Next, after the IRT analysis, we look at the correlations and look for correlations that we are already aware of from the literature. So we see the typical correlates, gender, we see um, risk, we see uh, college education or not, and income. And what's interesting is the big five scale and also the big three scale reveal very similar correlates. So when we would test for coefficient, uh, coefficient equality, um, there would be no difference between the coefficients, at least for those who are significant here, the significant different from zero, from zero. We can also do that with regard to the predictive validity. So now the big three or big five are not the um, dependent variable, they are the independent variable. And we test that for, test that for several financial outcomes, um, retirement sa savings, um, how financially satisfied someone is, if I have an emergency fund, financial confidence and the credit card record. And we also see similar um, correlations um, between uh, the big three and these outcomes and the big five and these outcomes. Um, however, what we also see is that the big three um, reveals larger standard errors. So we are losing a little bit of precision here. Okay. So this alone is, of course, not evidence for the validity, but the correlation, they add up to a broader picture. We have this IRT analysis, um, the unidimensionality analysis, and we have this correlation analysis, and they all add up together to one picture. And as a result, we can say, okay, um, using this big three or big five is backed by psychometric evidence. Um, the big three works pretty well psychometrically, but we lose some precision, especially in the upper, um, in, the, uh, in the 
areas um, above zero or in the high proficient areas. But it's very suitable to capture abilities in um, the low ability areas. We have also seen this concurrent and predictive validity by the correlations. So the question now is, um, should I be using the big three or the big five? And like I said, it depends on your purpose, I would say. I mean, we can discuss about that. Um, there is a purpose for more granular item sets, larger scales, um, to capture more ability levels. It depends on the sample you are targeting first. And second, I would argue, it depends on um, if you want to implement these items in a survey that is not primarily geared towards one single objective, right? So there you have a very low cost by implementing these three items. And when it comes to big three versus big five, I would definitely argue the big three is sufficient to use because the additional two items, as we, as we have seen in these test information function, they do not add much. So, um, yeah, that's it. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you for listening. Um, so, I wonder uh, how you're looking at the fairness in terms of things like race and ethnicity when your sample size is so small. So, you have under a thousand ish is that correct yeah yeah and when you slice it especially by by ethnicity, by race you're not yeah actually seeing probably enough subcategories or maybe i'm missing what you're doing yeah there. um it's all it's always a bio work with a binary subcategory so you are either um you either have that race or not so it's okay. always zero one Number yeah categories do you have two Okay, so I think that might be problematic because I yeah. think there are certain, um, particularly racial backgrounds that are, that at least I've heard from more qualitative work that um, are very concerned about the questions being unfair to them specifically, whereas like, like black people might have a different um, response than potentially Asian people, things like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they are not they are not far away from the B threshold, some of them. Yeah, yeah. White, non-white. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Then, like, within the non-white category, there are some groups for whom these questions may be very unfair. Yeah. And for some groups, they may be fine. Yeah. So you are saying it would be advisable to make it more granular and investigate more subgroups? Especially because to I think rage. there's so yeah, many point, studies yeah. now coming out looking at the different effects by subgroups. And if we're worried that the measure might not be fair for some subgroups, yeah. then we should at least be able to know if that's true, right? Um, based on, I don't, I don't know yeah. if we can actually do it. With yeah, the then, then we are having this problem, what you mentioned with the sample size, probably, okay. that, we're, that it's going to become so granular. I don't so think you can do it with this data set, but I don't yeah. know if there's another data yeah. set that you can yeah. use that will address that. Question. At least for the big three. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't think yeah, you good would point. Do yeah. for the big five. Yeah. Good point, yeah. Yes. Um, I guess I was wondering if, if you think that these results would be context dependent in the sense that if the big three are asked independently versus as, uh, they are asked as part of a larger survey, um, people may pay different levels of attention to it. And I don't know if the ability to discriminate um, high knowledge and low knowledge would be affected by that. Um, what you mean is effort, uh, test taking effort? Are you referring to that? So, for example, um, I think in the end you ended with the two parameter specification, but yeah. there were other parameters that were inattention and guessing, no? The asymptotes of the curve you were yeah. saying. Yeah. And I would imagine that if the big three are the last of 50 questions versus if they are the first of 50 questions in a kind of like larger survey, my approach to answering those questions would yeah. be different than yeah. if they are asked. The, that's a good nice point. Way. Normally, we are very, very concerned with test taking effort because we have a separate paper on that with using the PISA data. And um, unfortunately, we don't have um, uh, timing lock data here um, so that we can check this um, effort. Um, and if the effort declines over time somehow, um, that would be definitely interesting. Uh, um, maybe we 
can uh, do it with a different data set um, when we investigate the other diff categories. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, hi, thanks. I, th I think this is a great paper and really advances our understanding of how to measure, measure financial literacy. So, uh, tip of the hat to the authors. Um, <laughs> question on content validity. So, uh, I know that the big, think of the big five, right? Yeah. So, two of those questions are on investing. And a third of households in America have no investment. So, have, have you given any thought to whether the, the, the big five span the areas that are important in terms of, of, of how we conceptualize financial literacy? Yeah, it depends how you would conceptualize financial literacy. I mean, um, you said how we conceptualize financial literacy. Who is we in this? Well, pretty, you know, a lot of people in this room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In terms of a construct, you know, essentially yeah. financial knowledge, financial literacy. So, you know, there are many topics that, that you could you could hit on. In, totally, so, totally. So, I guess my question is, has, maybe it's outside the scope of this paper, but ha, while you were writing it, has any been discussion been given to that? And I'm a big fan of Big Five. I often get <laughs> yeah. this question because <laughs> okay. we include, we yeah. include the It's more include. a question for Anna. Yeah, <laughs> can I, I, I was going to take that because, um, so I actually think, first of all, uh, let me answer a different question for a moment and then I, I'll come back to yours. It's actually great that we find this result by the big three and the big five, because if you think of how the, we designed the big five, the big five, just for you to know, they weren't designed together, right? We started with the big three and then we did the big five, but they had other objective when we did the big five. For example, it was in the middle of the financial crisis. And so there was a question about mortgages that we added to add and so on. So there were really two different criteria and the data shows. And I think, you know, it's part of the construction of the data set. Now, I totally understand the idea, are these questions unfair? You know, people are making different decisions depending on their financial status. But I want to remind you that particularly in the big three, there are two questions which I think affect everybody. Inflation affects everybody. The capacity to understand interest rates in the context of a financial decision affects everybody. You know, like no matter which decision you do, you have to take an interest rate, right? And conceptually, to me, semantically, I understand, I mean, we have asked these questions about um, risk to everybody in the world. You know, so in Ghana, people don't have stocks, but the point is, Today, to make financial decisions, you have to participate in the financial markets, right? So the fact that you don't participate and you don't know actually gives me a lot of information, right? And it might just be, you know, because you don't have experience, but in this current world, in a sense, to be successful, you know, there are certain things to be done. So I actually, I'm not quite sure it is unfair. I think, you know, maybe the world is unfair, um, but you know, these are some of the things that, you know, almost everybody has to do today. Yeah. They have to make plan for the future. They have to know what an interest rate or, is, or this is how financial market works. And this is how we, we came to design that, right? And so I'm pretty sure that if we ask very specific questions, you know, we will get a different answer and then people know the things they do but that is not what we are getting at. We are getting more an aspirational questions, perhaps, of what is the knowledge that people need today to participate to society, which is exactly how we have defined financial literacy in the PISA data. Yeah, yeah and to add that, I'm not sure how um, we directly can infer to content validity from this data because this is only a question we can answer theoretically and there are many papers on that already out there. So I would say this paper is more about construct validity and the criterion validity, these two parts. Yeah. Uh, yeah, great work. Um, so I will say, like, I was thinking about Carly's comment, right? And, and yeah, so you don't really, it's, it's hard when you mix white and non whites, right? Because non whites include Asians, yeah. African Americans, and True. Hispanics. So I think one data set is the HRS. Uh, we just collected through an experimental model um, in the 2020 wave, a retirement knowledge scale, and added the financial literacy question. So we have that. Of course, it's not a huge sample. 
uh, and then also the Understanding America study, right? They, you, you have other data set that you can look at race and ethnicity. Uh, age groups, do you look at differences in age groups? Do you? Um, age group, no, that we don't have as a diff, but like I said, this analysis um, means that we need to uh, create a binary indicator, but we can make, of course, several binary indicators for different age groups and test them against a control group, so to speak, be or a baseline group. Right? Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one last question here. Okay, this is not so much a, a question as just a gushing. I've been waiting for this paper for like 10 years. <laughs> I love this paper. And ever since... Yeah, I know, no, ever since Nolan Hout, you know, I've, I've, we've talked about this before. But if you could go back to just the slide where you show the three versus the five. The statistics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, um, uh, the, the last one, the last. The correlations? Yeah, this, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I found this financial satisfaction, uh, the, the lack of finding cure to be interesting. And I wonder if you have any reactions to this, to this thought. Um, which Jeremy uh, Burke and I were actually talking about earlier too, is that um, th satisfaction is an elusive good. So you can be doing very well in every single one of these metrics and still not be satisfied. <laughs> and, and you can be doing be relatively poorly and still be self-satisfied, and to say it that way. And I wonder what you guys think about that as a, as a, as a way to uh, interpret that finding. Yeah, interesting question. Well, First of all, uh, we have an endogeneity problem here that is not addressed, but it's also not the purpose of this paper to um, establish causality here. What these um, measurement papers typically do, they are doing the test theory and the validation analysis, and then we are showing some correlations that we expect to see and test whether we actually see them. And yeah, and we see here one correlation that should come up, but it doesn't come up. And yeah, so far, we don't have an explanation for that, to be honest, um, why that is. Yeah. So. so we actually have it in the AER paper, which is uh, published outside, which is that, you know, when you use very um, proxy for what we think is well-being, right, having precautionary saving or um, having a good credit score, Right, it's a little bit of an approximation, right? I mean, these are these are outcome variable, but it's not well-being, right? Because well-being goes into utility function. I always tell my student, you know, it's not that the ultimate objective of financial literacy is to save more or borrow less, right? Is to be uh, happy. So in the in the paper um, with Bernheim, what we try to do is actually filter this through utility, right? So do you do you get that? And the problem is we don't want to give any structure to the preferences, you know, so that we are more flexible. And the results are like this, actually, that, you know, a financial literacy might work on a lot of dimension, but, you know, when it comes to utility, it, it's hard, you know? Maybe it's hard to be happy. That's it, right? And that's... Uh, <laughs> So I'm sorry for to deliver this news on a Friday night, but uh, <laughs> but uh, you know that's uh, you know if you if you publish something like they, like that, you're going to the AR. I don't know that might that's perhaps is the good news. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, Thank you so much for the comment. All right, um, the clicker, okay. And then, so if I speak here, you can hear me. If I wanna move around, I should use this, right? Okay, I think I'll use this. Well, uh, thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity to share my work, but especially thanks for giving me the opportunity to be here and learn from all of you and, and have an opportunity to network and, and talk about all, all the interesting things that you're working on. Um, so uh, this is the last presentation. I'm gonna try to be more anecdotal. And if you want more of the technicality of this work, I'm happy to share the paper. Uh, but here, what I wanna share with you is, um, a project, right, uh, where I work in the community to develop uh, a mobile intervention on financial education. So I'm gonna give you the motivation, kind of tell you the story about Mind Your Money, uh, how we came out with it, uh, some of the challenges that we face. 
I'll talk a little bit on the program details and the program evaluation. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the lessons learned on this experience, because I think there is a lot of opportunity here, especially as we move ahead uh, in the post-pandemic world. And we're seeing the opportunity of using digital technologies to engage hard to reach communities, right? And, and my work is with, um, with the Latino community in Los Angeles area. So the motivation of my your money. So as I say, this is a community-based digital intervention uh, on financial capability, where I focus on the Latino community in Los Angeles area. My goal was um, to, in some way, and I'll tell you the story. So I hear I say, you know, well, first, why do we want to focus on Hispanics, right? Well, we want to focus on Hispanics uh, because we know that um, they lag behind when it, when it comes to financial knowledge, right? So, Right in here, you know, we know that uh, looking at a systematic review of all the studies out there who have looked at this difference, uh, Hispanics actually score 40% lower than whites, right? Um, then we know that uh, Hispanics also are likely to engage on financial behaviors to a higher degree in comparison to other groups um, that are detrimental to their financial well-being. And then we know that uh, one very important piece here, especially because the idea of mind your money is to reach uh, uh, Latinos through, uh, through their mobile devices, is that uh, we know that um, Hispanics, right, are what we call, um, have a higher smartphone dependency in comparison to other groups, right? And what we mean by that really is that they are more likely to do a lot of things in their cell phone and they, they are unlikely to have a computer at home that they will work with, right? And that's where I really saw the opportunity. So where did this idea come from? So back in 2017, uh, some of you might remember uh, my retirement account, uh, my RA program, right? So I did a community-based intervention uh, to promote retirement savings and opening uh, my retirement account. And I work with community organizations. We were in a computer lab. We will invite people to come. And we found that it was very effective. We found like, um, but one thing that I realized when I was doing this work in the community is that a lot of my participants were actually pulling out their phone to do things. And I was like, but there is a computer here. And she's like, no, no, I'm just going to use my phone. Okay. And then for this uh, randomized control trial, I will send them text messages to remind them to open my array. And then I will send them text messages to come back to the workshops, you know, and so I will, and then I realized, you know, that it was very effective, right? And I work with a community partner. I think I have, uh, did I put the name here? Uh, Isaias Hernandez, who is um, a co-PI in this work. And he has been in the space of financial coaching for many years, right? So I work with him in this project. And then I, you know, and, and I don't know if you're familiar with the financial coaching model, but in Los Angeles area, you know, it's very prevalent, right? A lot of community organizations who want to increase asset building among minorities, right, will have financial coaches, right? And the idea is that you offer this service to the community, financial coaches are available to meet with you, right? You make an appointment, you go with a financial coach for like a 30 minute, one hour. Uh, the goal is that you probably go several times, right? And what Isaias was sharing with me at the time is like, you know, to be honest, people will probably come once and it's very hard to bring them back. And then I say, okay, can you think about how can we design and implement, you know, and evaluate a digital program that tries to replicate what you do with your clients, right? And we just keep these uh, people in the community engaged in the learning process by themselves, right? Because thinking about meeting with a financial coach can be very challenging, right? If the financial coach is only available from nine to five, right? And you have to work, you have children, right? It can be very complicated, right? And when I was doing these workshops for this project, we will do them at night and we will do it on Saturdays. And that's sort of like a luxury for a lot of people in the community, right? So then I say, how can we go beyond that? Well, there were several reasons people were telling me, no, it's not going to work, right? And, I mean, we're talking about this in 2017, 2018, right? So I was told, no, 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 they don't have cell phones. No, they don't have access to the internet. No, they, are, they don't want to be engaged in, the, in their cell phone. And I was just persistent. I was like, no, I think it can work, right? So then uh, finally we applied for funding and we received funding in 2019. This is before the pandemic, right? We had the idea, we got the funding, you know, I got, you know, the community organizations is still a little bit skeptical about like, but we have always been in person. And I was like, yes, but this is different. And it was always like, but how are we going to do what we used to do in person? And I'm like, we're going to do it the same, but different. 
And, and it, was, it took me a lot of persistence, I have to say. Uh, but then we implemented in April of 2021. So let me give you just some details of how this program works. So the idea of this program is that I'm working with uh, the Hispanic community in Los Angeles area. And my goal is two things. One, give them access to information of how to manage their finances, right? And using material that is applicable to their everyday lives. But very importantly, I also want to motivate them to change, right? So the messages were always very encouraging. The activities that they had to do uh, for our program were always targeting towards behavioral change. And I think that was, that was one of the reasons why our program was effective. So here the idea, right, again, you know, it was very important, especially because uh, we were trying something new, right? Financial coaching in LA has always been done in person. And we wanted to change that, or we wanted to find a way to complement that, right? Um, so I partnered with community organizations. So it's Moon Community Center and the Mexican uh, American Opportunity Foundation. And I work with, uh, which a lot of you are familiar here, from the Understanding America Study team, right? They provide me with the digital solutions. So which means that I use their platform for my program and for the text messages, right? So it's not an app. So I always have to say it's not an app. It's a very simple program where program participants will receive a text message that will take them to complete an activity, right? So it will be this week, learn about how you can improve your credit score, go here. And then they will click there and they will go to my platform, right? And well, the UAS platform, but created for tailored for this, uh, for this program. And they will go and learn about it, right? And this is a six month program with one activity per week, right? So if you think about it, I mean, that's a lot of engagement, right? And that's uh, really helping people to learn, right? So here, one thing we did with this is that we created all the material in English and Spanish. That was very important for us. We gave participants the option to select what language they wanted to, to use. And we recruited 125 um, Latinos and Latinas in Los Angeles area. We work with a community organization. So, um, so 83% of our, 83 participants were from, well, recruited through the community organizations. And actually 42 was recruited through the Understanding America convenience sample of um, a group of, of families they have in LA that was recruited through First Five LA, right? And, um, and, and that actually gave us a really good, interesting experience because we're able to see how the community sample uh, does in comparison to an internet sample, right? Which uh, the community sample is different, right? Because they know the community organization and they, are, they have different ties, right? To, to, to us as, as the program, right? So who were our participants? As you can see here, some statistics, right? Well, 98% were Hispanics. That was our, our inclusion criteria. I guess uh, 2% kind of got, 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 got there. <laughs> yeah. They, <laughs> So 50% had at least high school education. So this is, this is a group of low levels of education. 61% uh, were born in the United States. So as you can see, we were working with immigrant communities. Uh, the, seven, the majority were renters, right? Of course, we're talking about LA where housing is, is very challenging. Uh, we had 43% uh, were full-time. Uh, one of our requirements was that, there was, uh, that they were working, right? So either full-time or part-time. Um, it was interesting to see that 42% will say that Spanish was the nat native language, but we ended up with 77% preferring to do all the activities in English, right? And then, uh, as you can see here, this is a, a low-income uh, household, right? Because 52% had an income below or equal to uh, 33,000, which, you know, in, in LA is, is very low, right? And here, uh, as you can see, we also had a majority being bank, 80%. Okay, but how was our program? Uh, how did we design it? So we use the curricula from uh, Your Money, Your Goals, which some of you might be familiar from the CFPB, uh, because that was a curricula that you know my community partner was using in the past, and it has worked, and it's, it's designed for low and moderate income families. And we designed it, uh, again, with a very, um, the community organization was very involved in all the stages. So ECS and I partnered since the beginning, you know, and, and we were getting feedback from the community. And we, the way that we organize our program was like, you know, every month they will do these, right? So like the first week, they will learn about that specific topic. Then the second week, they actually will apply what they learned to a tool that we designed on the platform. Then on week three, that was kind of like our 
enforcement, right? Take an action, right? Our motivation, right? Tell us what action you took related to what you learned this month. And then also tell us if you weren't able to take an action related to that, tell us why, right? So we wanted to learn about that. And then on the last week, we also asked them um, to do uh, what I call the money diary, right? So just reflect on all your income expenses, savings, and debt, right? Because we wanted to create a habit to track, you know, their income in their household. Oh, yeah, and I was mentioned because um, the way we do it, everything was electronically, right? Everything was through the mobile phone. Uh, we did, uh, it was during the pandemic. So initially when we designed the study, we were going to meet in person for the first time. Of course, that didn't happen. But we had a, an optional meeting in Zoom uh, where we will kind of walk them through the material, right? And through like the structure of the program. Okay, so here, as you can see here, I mean, those are the topics that we cover in six months, right? Uh, very applicable for low and moderate income families. Um, we were in the field between May 2021 and June uh, 2022. We, we're still collecting some follow-up surveys. Um, this summer is our last one. And we also uh, provided them with more optional material from the CFPB website uh, on you know, how to manage your finances uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the CFPB have some good material about that that was useful for our participants. Okay, so how do we evaluate our program? So this program was, the evaluation was designed as a randomized control trial with a wait list control group. So it was very important that everyone who participated in the study will benefit from the program, right? So the idea here is that the control group will get the intervention after six months, right? So we collect the data at the beginning, then at six months we collect the data with both groups, and then the control group will go through the intervention, right? And we, uh, we really look, wanted to look at, you know, what is the impact of our program? So one, on retention rates, right? We wanted to see, well, is this program more effective, keep people in the community engaged than the in-person uh, financial coaching retention rates that we have seen, you know, when these community organizations have done that in the past. And then we also wanted to evaluate the impact of our program on the financial capability score, uh, the financial self-efficacy. And then also we were very interested in also evaluating the impact of our program on financial stress. And here we had, um, you're probably familiar with the first two. The last one, we use the one from the Financial Health Network. That is a very simple question, like, um, did you experience financial stress in the previous month, and did that affect your health, right? Um, so here, this just to give you uh, some uh, vision, and, uh, some stats on the retention rates. Uh, we had very high retention rates. I mean, we, we feel that we were very, ex very successful at like, keeping people in the community engage with the material, right? I mean, I think for us, we feel that that was a big win uh, to be able to keep, you know, 70, uh, 74% 70, of our participants, right? To come back and do all the activities at the, um, at, the at, at six months, right? We had some, I will say we have some tricks to keep them engaged. I mean, I feel like I'm running out of time, but um, but yeah, so we did, uh, we, we, I'll tell more if there is more time about what were our, some of our tricks, right? As you can see here, of course, what you can see there is that the retention rates for the control group are higher because this is the group of people who will get the program later, right? So it's expected that they will stay more engaged. Um, and then you can see here that the retention rates were higher for the community uh, participants, right? Um, so here, just giving you some estimates, and I know you're tired now, so I'll be... I'll be sort of brief here and we'll start wrapping up and then going for the next thing. Uh, but here we just look at, you know, uh, using a difference in difference approach. Uh, we, we do a, a treatment on the treatment analysis, um, on the treatment of the treated analysis where we know when we look at, um, there was no significant difference on the characteristics of the treatment and control group. Then we also didn't see any significant difference uh, for most variables when it comes to comparing those who complete the, who, who stay at six months and then those who leave the, who didn't, you know, who didn't come back at six months. Um, one thing to mention here, um, we have data that was collected at, at baseline. And then for the treatment group, we collect the data monthly. For the control group, we collect the data at three months and at six months. So one, we analyze first, just what is the difference between baseline and six months, that's model one. And then model two, we analyze what is the difference. You know, we use all that data that we have for both groups. As you can see here, right, for the financial capability score, we can see that um, we, uh, we found a significant positive effect. 
Uh, for the financial stress indicator, we see that when we use more data, right? And then for the financial self-efficacy, we see a marginal uh, effect on that. Um, so here, I just include here, some of you might be familiar with the financial capability score. We ended up working with that indicator because my community partner was the indicator that he was using in the community at that time and that uh, other community organizations were using. And these are the behaviors that we saw that our program had a positive effect, which were probably the most of the behaviors that we were really targeting with our program, right? So here we can see that, you know, our participants uh, were more, more likely to have a budget and a spending plan, which is something that we try to encourage with information and with the money diary that they had to do every month. And then also they feel more confident to pay for unexpected expense, right? So we thought that that was something, you know, that we talk about in our material. Um, so it was good to see that. So just to summarize here, Right, so we find that our program had a positive impact, right, on, on financial capability score, right, and then also we find that there was some uh, decrease in financial stress. Um, when we look at the uh, impact of our program, we can say that it was of a medium uh, effect size if we look at the standard deviations. Um, so here in this case, you know, we felt that our program was a good tool. I mean, just to share briefly, if I have time, um, when we were in the community, uh, we had a community event uh, when we were wrapping up the program. And, um, and you know, the participants came and, you know, were sharing their experiences. And this is, stay with me. So there was one participant that say, I love the program because I was learning about my finances when I was riding the bus home from work. And that was the time that I was in my phone just looking at it, and that was perfect time for me to do it. I had another participant, they say, you know, this program was so helpful because when my kids go to bed, I will go to my room, close my door, and learn about my finances by myself. And that was a perfect time for me to do it. So I think those really stick to me, you know, because I felt that our program was very flexible. Um, so here, right, I mean, just the lessons learned, of course, I have to say it was a process, you know, it was, it was not easy. There was a lot of tension around it, but I think, you know, one of the main things I learned you gotta keep things uh, simple and specific, right? I felt that, uh, especially when you are working with an interdisciplinary team, when you're work working with community partners, right? It's very important that you keep things simple, right? And one thing is that what our, pro our program was super simple, right? It's not an app, it's just a platform. If you get a text message and it will take you exactly where I want you to go that week, right? And, uh, and again, I, we have some flexibility and some tricks that I can show you. We have more time. Um, again, you know, when we're collecting data with the community, you also have to simplify. I mean, there were many things I wish I could have collected, but at the same time, I didn't want to overwhelm them with my survey questions, right? So I wanted to stick to some of my primary outcomes. I think, you know, what is also very important is that you really need to be specific about the financial behavior you want to change. You cannot change everything, right? And, and that was a conversation I had with my community partner. He's like, well, how's it going to work for people who have like a very high debt? Like, no, then that, that person probably will need more help than this program, you know? So I think that's another thing that we need to be clear. And then also, of course, you know, what are the financial outcomes that you want to measure? And then very importantly, when you are in a team, you have to be very specific about the role of everyone in that team, right? And then I will say, I mean, I'll wrap up with this slide uh, and the next one just to, um, it's very important that the community see the need for this to be successful. It's very important that the community partner is involved in all the stages of the process, right? And I think that I will mention quickly, you know, it's very important that um, there is funding that can be more equitable allocated between community organizations and research institutions. Our funding actually was a very good funding mechanism for this work. So it was funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and we receive funding very equally, you know, as community partners get the same funding as the researchers. I mean, it was, it was an excellent program. So I have to mention here all the collaborators in this project. I feel like, you know, we, uh, it was definitely a team effort, right? Uh, people with different skills, different expertise uh, were part of these efforts. And I just want to say thank you for staying until the last to listen to my work. Does this work? Okay. Uh, try to be quick. Two questions for you for your theory of change. Um, I've seen a lot of literature speak of 
the need to put the motivation before the information. I'm just wondering, it, it's very specific. So it, have you come across the same sort of thing or is it different on your end? Uh, because I haven't touched the literature for at least like three years uh, in terms of uh, behavior change. And then the second question was, uh, did you find any type of dosage effect, especially for those who dropped off uh, with the four weeks? Uh, no, great point. Okay, so this is just, you know, one thing you are right, the motivation got to be key. So when we were creating the program, actually my community partner told me, when I meet with people, we usually talk about credit scores first. And then we, I was like, ouch. I don't really want to talk about credit scores, you know, the first time I'm learning about these. So, so I was like, how about if we talk more about like, like financial plans and make it exciting, right? So our first week is actually thinking about, okay, so let's come out with a financial plan. Let's keep, the, let's keep it very motivational, right? And then our text messages were always very motivational, very simple. And you are right. I mean, our material was created. I was like good about that. Like our text messages were 180 characters sort of around that. Uh, my information that they had to read on the platform has to be around 400 words. I will read it. I will. I even work with uh, with someone to make a sh to make sure that it's simple, understandable. Um, you are right. I mean, it's, it's got to be very important how you present the information. And I agree that our program is access to information, but motivation for change is a big piece, right? Because if I only give them the information, but I'm not motivating the change, that's not going to happen. Use. So, um, did everybody that you now had in the end of the study participate in every single intervention, or is there variation in which parts they actually took and whether they like dropped out for a week or two and then came back and something? And is that something that you could in exploit in in the sense that you learn something about which parts are more effective than others? Great question. So, this is a I didn't go into detail, but the way that we created the program was kind of like a class. So you will get a text message every week of what you're supposed to be doing that week. But I give you flexibility, which means that if you didn't do the work on the first or second week, it's okay, not a big deal. You still get the third week and the fourth week. But by the end of the fourth week, you have to complete all those activities of that month to go into the next month. And if you don't complete them, that's when you drop out. And the way we did it, you know, we will tell participants, you know, this is week four, make sure you complete for this, you complete by Sunday at midnight, the activities for this month, otherwise you can't continue on the program, right? And then what we did, we, that message was very effective, I think, we, and then we did follow up phone calls for those who stay behind, so I had a, what I call a soft deadline and a hard deadline. Um, so the soft deadline will tell them, you know, you, you don't complete by this Sunday, you're out. But then, of course, they were, we called them that week. But then if they didn't complete it by the following week after the phone calls, they were out, right? So I think that flexibility was very successful. Um, so we wouldn't be able to test, you know, what material is more effective because, you know, we had that flexibility in it. But I think, you know, with high retention rates, I think that was a good approach for us. Any questions? I think we're ready to wrap up, right? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to follow up, email me. Um, I, I got to run to catch my airplane after these, but I, I, after the next session. So, but yeah, please stay in touch. Oh, okay. Then yeah, if questions, let's see what else I can say. Oh, the tricks. Well, I think that was a big trick. Be flexible, you know, like, you know, be, be flexible with, with people, like do it like in a class, right? I mean, sometimes people lag behind and, and that's okay. Uh, the phone calls, I think it's a big one, but again, you know, a phone call is a resource, right? And especially, I mean, right now we're in conversations with other community organizations to do it at a higher scale, right? So phone calls, that's why my soft deadline was very useful because then you will get those who can do it by the text message and then the few other people who needed it, a little bit more encouragement, then we will call them. Um, so then I will say that's definitely a trick that worked well, especially, and I think that trick is very important if you scale up. Um, and then, you know, then on the, yeah, and then some people need to need a little bit more encouragement, right? And then the way we work it out, we work with uh, the community organization. So the community uh, staff will call the community sample, but then for the UAS sample, uh, the UAS team will call the, 
that sample. I wouldn't be able to reach to them. Uh, compensation, so participants were compensated for their time, for completing surveys, for completing activities. Um, we, uh, what else? I, but yeah, I mean, the community event we had at the end was very rewarding. I even have a video, you know, where we can really see, you know, the community experience with it. I still get emails of people, when are we doing this again? And, um, and, you know, right now we are in conversations to try to get funding to, to be able to do it at a larger scale. I, I also want to move into the direction of adapting the material to incorporate techniques for managing financial stress. Right, because I feel right now, my mind your money is all about you know financial capability. All the information is about finances, right? But we do find some impact on financial stress. But I think to make it more powerful, right, it's really thinking about a curriculum. And I'm working with a clinical psychologist from Pepperdine, and we just got a little funding to kind of design it where we're going to have financial capability models uh, specific to to the money management, and then some models specific to managing financial stress which we think is very important for low and moderate income uh, minority families in the community.